Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that very warm welcome and thank you President Rosenberg for those kind words. I hope the students in the group don't walk away with the impression that the most important achievement or the most important activity is ping pong. <laughs> because I, I noticed that got the loudest applause. But I must admit it is fun to play ping pong. <laughs> And good morning, McAllister. It's wonderful to be back here. For me, coming to McAllister is always a bit like homecoming. And yesterday, when I came off the plane and saw old friends, Roger Mosvik, who also was my coach when I was doing debating here, and Dave Langren, I realized I was truly back home. I'm especially moved to help you inaugurate the Institute for global citizenship. This, the mission of the Institute to advance McAllister's commitment to internationalism, multiculturalism, and an end understanding is more important than ever in today's world. Let me congratulate all of you who have brought this initiative to fruition. I will follow the development of this new center with great deal of interest and alumni pride as it begins its work in earnest. The Institute is the latest expression of the global outlook that has always been part of McAllister's very heart and soul. Today I had the honor of attending the flag raising event where the UN flag was raised, and it reminded me that when I came here in 1959, the flag had already been flying here for nine years. And even back then, the U McAllister had an international outlook. So the McAllister Global Institute and Global Citizenship is built on very solid foundations, and its programs are very fertile ground in which to grow. Its launch could hardly come at a more critical time in the life of the international community in general and the United Nations in particular. More than ever before, the human race faces global problems from poverty and inequality to nuclear proliferation, from climate change to bad flu, from terrorism to HIV AIDS, from ethnic, ethnic cleansing to genocide, and finally, to trafficking in the lives and bodies of human beings. These are problems that no one country, however powerful, can tackle alone. We need to come together and work out global solutions. World leaders understood this when they gathered in September, last September, in the 60th anniversary year of the United Nations for the 2005 World Summit, which I believe will be seen by future generations as a seminal event in the history of the organization. It did not achieve everything we might have hoped for, but our leaders did agree on important changes across the board. They recognize that development, security, and human rights are not only important in themselves, but also reinforce and indeed depend on each other. The three freedoms which all human beings crave, freedom from want, freedom from war or large-scale violence, and freedom from arbitrary and degrading treatment are closely interconnected. There is no long-term security, and I repeat, no long-term security without development. 
And there is no development without security. And no society can long remain secure or prosperous without respect for human rights and the rule of law. The summit also reaffirmed an unambiguous resolve to achieve the Millennium Development Goals, agreed by all the world's governments as a blueprint for building a better world in the 21st century. These eight commitments range from halving extreme poverty to halting the spread of HIV AIDS and providing universal primary education all by the target date of 2015. They represent a set of simple but powerful objectives that every man and woman in the street, from Minnesota to Malaysia, can easily support and understand. And on one crucial issue, the responsibility to protect, the summit achieved a breakthrough all member states accepted that individually and collectively they have a responsibility to protect populations threatened with genocide, ethnic cleansing, and crime against humanity. Other important steps have been taken since the summit. Member states have created a peace-building commission to better manage the difficult transition from war to peace. They have established a central emergency response fund to help victims of humanitarian disasters, whether man-made or natural. They have also established a democracy fund to strengthen institutions and to help countries in transition and ensure that people can exercise their democratic rights. Most recently, the General Assembly created a new Human Rights Council, a historic step that will enable us to restore the UN's credibility as the champion of the oppressed around the world. The General Assembly is also undertaking a review of all the mandates <coughs> still in force, which were given to the organization by its members between 1946 and 2001. You can imagine the challenge of weeding out unnecessary mandates. This should make it possible to avoid much duplication and waste and ensure that our work reflects the current priorities of member states rather than those of yesteryear. For my part, I have placed before the membership a new set of proposals to overhaul the organization's management. Building on previous rounds of reform, I aim to make the United Nations a more transparent, accountable, and effective instrument of service to mankind. But at the summit, there were also areas where world leaders failed to reach any agreement at all. The biggest disappointment for me was their failure to chart a way forward on disarmament and non-proliferation. Can there be any threat more alarming in today's world than that of a nuclear or biological weapon falling into the hands of terrorists or being used by a state as a result of some terrible misunderstanding or miscalculation. The more states have such weapons, the greater the risk. The more those states that already have them increase their arsenal or insist that these weapons are essential for their national security, the more other states feel that they too must have them for their security. For 35 years, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty regime has been remarkably successful in protecting humankind from this danger. But now it faces a serious challenge. Today's headlines concern Iran. <clears throat> 